system that uh, we're testing out to see whether or not we will use. Uh, my name is William Macbeth. I'm Director of Training and Marketing here at the Manning Centre in Calgary. I want to thank everybody for joining us today for this webinar. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Vincent Harris. He is the CEO of Harris Media and Chief Digital Strategist for Republican presidential nominee, or uh, yeah, nominee, uh, Rand Paul. And he's here today to talk about the 24 second news cycle, creating engaging online content. So with that, it's my pleasure to throw it over to Vincent. Thank you, I really appreciate it and appreciate the opportunity here. So I will try to be as interesting as possible. And um, if people have questions during this, I don't know the best, if there's, there's a little chat it looks like and people can tweet me questions at Vincent Harris too, and I'll try to answer them. Uh, I'll ha I have my Twitter up on my, on my phone here. So at Vincent Harris, and I will try to answer as many as possible. So um, let's just start. It says starting screen sharing here. So let's just start. Uh, hopefully everyone can see this. I'm hopeful. Um, let me make sure everybody can. Um, uh, I would guess that everybody can. So we'll just we'll just move move forward from there. So um, uh, if you can't see that, tweet me at Vincent Harris. Um, so I want to start by talking about the 24 second news cycle. There was a there was a New York Times. Uh, a journalist who said with the rise of cable news that we were living in a a 24 hour news cycle um uh, sorry with the with the with the uh beginning of, of broadcast news that we were in a 24 hour news cycle with cable news we we're in a 24 minute news cycle now with twitter we're in a 24 second news cycle but there's a really important question that i wanted to start off with everybody that just talks kind of and and labors my uh point here what color do you see in this in this uh, address? Right, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But um, you know these these um, kind of quick internet uh, uh, fads. This this obviously went around earlier this this um, uh, year where this dress and people are seeing different colors in this in this um, uh, dress and it was big online and then it's gone. And I brought it back up to help remind everybody how quick things are big online and how how quickly things uh, uh, fade as well. So I wanted to to start off before we get into some of the, the meat here and just talk a little bit about what's going on online, what's going on from an online perspective. Um, really things have completely shifted and we've seen this on Rand Paul's presidential campaign where now really digital is the first thing everybody thinks of around a debate. Everyone thinks of how can we raise money off of this debate? Uh, when when someone sees something going on during the debate, they go and they look online to see if it's true or not. And virtually every piece of of um, uh, data, academic data, um, uh, you know, public data out there, survey data shows that the internet is now arguably the most important medium for consuming news and information. Um, you can see some numbers here on this on this slide um and you know this has obviously changed dramatically for us in campaigns there's a wonderful book that i recommend you all buy it's called post broadcast democracy it's by a political scientist named marcus Pryor. and it, and in the book he talks about how uh my grandparents generation i'm 27 and my my grandparents that are in their 60s and 70s when they got home from work they watched one of three uh uh news channels they watched abc cbs or nbc and everyone in the country got all their news from one of those three channels right but then we had cable news cnn was first in 1980 then we get msnbc and fox news and now we have what's called personalized news and this makes it so hard for us in campaigns because people if they don't want to read something they will click off if something's not interesting they will click off people would prefer to watch cat memes than they would to actually listen to political news and information and marcus Pryor talks about this in his book he talks about how when people have a choice of watching sports or watching movies or watching some news about kim kardashian or caitlin jenner they prefer to watch that entertainment news than they would about politics and this makes it harder Pryor goes even further 
and says, um, oh, here we go. Someone says, okay, got it. Got it. Hopefully this is good for Peter who sent me the tweet. Thank you, Peter. So, um, you know, this goes, Peter, let me know if that's if that's working better. But um, this goes even even further as it relates to what types of voters are actually consuming news and information uh, from from soft news, which we're going to talk a lot about today, which is entertainment media, and then hard news, which is someone laying out a policy position or somebody talking specifically about where a candidate stands on it on an issue. People like soft news. We're going to talk a lot about that today. The the um, internet is the most trusted source of information. This should be a little scary to us, right? There was a bipartisan study done after the 2012 election, both by a Republican and Democratic polling firm, and they asked people, where did you find the most political news and information that you trusted? And people said that they found that information online. A little scary, and we're going to talk more about that today. But we should remember as we go through all of this today that people are going online to find out if things are true or not. They're going online to find out more information. And what are they seeing about you and your brand and your candidates? That's what we're going to talk more about today. And then lastly, people are obviously watching and consuming news and information the same amount on television as they are on digital devices now. And by the end of the 2016 cycle, this will even be more online. The Internet will surpass television as the number one source of news and information. It's already the number one news and source. Uh, this uh, for for younger people. There's a study about millennial moms. Millennial moms use their mobile devices more than any other piece of news and information. And lastly, there's another really good study done by a, a communications professor here at the University of Texas where she talks about this concept of what's called selective exposure. And we should talk about this a little bit too today. People only read what they want to. People are selecting news and information that reinforces their their previously held political views. If you're Republican, you read you read Fox News or you read IJ Review. If you're Democrat, you read CNN or MSNBC or you read BuzzFeed. So how do we cut through that? We're going to talk about that today. Lastly, the 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 last piece of kind of base that I've got for you all here. There's a there is uh, this this concept of soft news actually can be very successful at priming voters to to find out hard news. So a lot of people ask me, what's the point, Vincent, in posting memes of cats? What's the point in posting shorter, cheeky videos? Videos. I don't know if you all saw the video of Lindsey Graham. He hit his you know cell phone once uh, Donald Trump released Lindsey Graham, the senator from South Carolina, his cell phone number. Well, Lindsey Graham did this video where he took a bunch of cell phones and he put them in blenders and he ripped them up. Well, what was the purpose of that? This this study by Zenos and Becker showed that even though people are consuming that information, something like that Lindsey Graham video, it's going to make them more interested in the hard news and in politics. So we're going to talk mostly today about entertainment media, which I believe fully is the is the way to really get voters engaged. OK, so what's the difference now? We have these two boxes. When I go home after work and I watch Netflix through my TV box, I'm actually watching the Internet. And what we're going to see is this is this computer is going to be pushed into that TV box. And this is already happening. I, as the digital guy, am buying ads that are showing on TV. During the 2012 uh, presidential race, we were buying ads on Pandora in the Iowa caucus for Governor Rick Perry that were showing up when people were listening to Pandora on their TV. That's what's going on. And soon they're all going to be blended together. Everything will be digital. This will not be separated out into television and digital. Everything will be digital. And this is occurring now. This is so important for what we're going to talk about the rest of today, too. Google likes to talk about what they call a three screen approach. And this is how I approach every single kind of communications plan that I put together for my clients. The average voter, let's just think about them. And I'm concerned in the United States with the average Republican voter. So the average Republican voter is going to go home. They're going to turn on Fox News. They're going to have their laptop in their lap and their cell phone in their hand. They're going to be on Facebook. They're going to be texting. How do we reach those people? And here's exactly what happens. Take the 2012 Senate race here. I was working for a man you might have heard of named Ted Cruz. Our, our opponent at the time, David Dewhurst, spent millions and millions of dollars attacking Ted Cruz on television around this issue of Chinese tires. He claimed that Mr. Cruz 
he was working with the Chinese government to steal patents from Americans. Well, as soon as the ad went on TV, I saw search traffic spike to high heaven about people seeking information for Ted Cruz and Chinese tires. We were there, just like you need to be there, making sure that your rebuttal, every time you're attacked, every time somebody's talking about what's going on on TV, what are they seeing online, every single time, every new issue that arises, every new voter cleavage, every time something in a race changes, you need to have new search ads, new content that is that that is steeped in whatever is being talked about on, on screen one. And then on screen three, you push out more content that will reinforce. So let me give you one other example. During the debate, when, uh, I don't know if you saw the Republican presidential debate, but the debate opened with Donald Trump saying that he uh, wouldn't pledge to be a uh, Republican, and he might run as an independent. So my uh, a client, Senator Rand Paul, went after him for it. Well, as soon as that happened, we knew people online would be going and seeking more information. So we went up with different ads, and we released that clip on Facebook just 10, 15 minutes after Senator Paul said that, so that screen two and screen three were being reinforced by screen one. So think about every time that, you're, that your organization or your client is getting, is getting news, uh, sorry, is getting press on local news is getting is getting uh, uh, picked up by national news. You need to have search ads up. You need to have some specific kind of content. We would even do this for Senator Cruz. We would get so specific. We would change out the branding and it took a lot of freaking work, but we change out the branding on our website every time Senator Cruz was on a different Fox News show. And when he went on Glenbeck Radio, we would have, which for this purpose I'm saying is screen one. Uh, every time you went on Glenn Beck Radio, we would have a brand new splash page that would welcome Glenn Beck listeners to his website. It worked. People loved it. It was it was fitting with this three screen approach. I am going to talk about now. Um, let me check Twitter really quick. OK, I am going to talk now about why digital is so important. Digital is the best place right now, and again, it's a little scary. Not only is it the most trusted source of, of news and information, but it's the best place now to be target to be targeting advertising. You can target people on an individual basis. So I worked for Linda McMahon. She ran for United States Senate in 2012 in Connecticut. She owns the WWE. She had a lot of money. She spent $50 million running for Senate two times, so $100 million total over two campaigns. To reach Fairfield County, which is the largest county in Connecticut, and you have to reach Fairfield County because half of essentially half of all Connecticut voters live in this county. You have to go on New York television to reach people on TV. That is a waste of of only one out of ten dollars spent on New York television actually went into the state of Connecticut. Think about how much of a waste that was. She spent, I think, something like $25 million on New York television, and only $2.5 million actually went into the state. That's amazing. But this is obviously all gone with digital. You can advertise to this side of the street or the other side of the street. You can take lists of voters that you have and match by address, which we're getting 60, 70, 80% match rate matching with a company called Axiom through Facebook. Facebook's incredibly powerful. Twitter's doing the exact same thing. They let you create a tailored audience and you can actually go and then and you know run ads to a specific group of people. You can also on Twitter, which is something that's really cool, take a group of journalists, create a, a list of journalists, and run ads targeted just to those journalist feeds. We've done this a, a lot for Senator Paul. You can really maximize and get a good bang for your buck because whatever piece of content that you have, those journalists will, will take that content and they'll push that content forward for you. So you can spend a little bit of money advertising and get the journalist to actually pick that up and take that out further for you. So how do we raise money online? How do we raise money online? Well, this is a breakdown. Money comes online from email. Email is still really important for raising money online. Email is still really important for selling product. We'll talk a little bit about selling product and kind of brandizing your, your initiative. This is how we raised the $2.7 million that just came through Tracked Online donations for Senator Cruz in 2012. The bulk of the tracked monies came through email, Facebook and Twitter. They were hardly there, but it's still important to obviously use Facebook and Twitter as a mechanism to gain email addresses. Email is still king to online fundraising. It's still king to online action. We are doing this big uh, initiative right now to stop the nuclear Iran deal. 
uh, with a with a group called Secure America Now. I would encourage you all to look them up. We're doing a wonderful job, and there's and there's a there's a whole lot of great examples on their Facebook page and on Twitter about proper good digital advocacy. Secure America Now, and what. What we're finding is that uh, generating calls, direct calls to these members of, of Congress, email is still the best way to actually generate calls for the cheapest amount. If you're trying to generate advocacy calls, Facebook is, is good. It's a close number two. And certainly there's, there's reasons to do Twitter engagements too. But uh, uh, email is generating calls for the cheapest amount. This is one of my, of my clients. He's a lieutenant governor of Texas. And I wanted to highlight this because I think he did such a good job of responding himself. And by the way, I think voters really recognize authenticity. And this is something that's very hard in, you know, in the digital world where people are hiring firms like mine, or perhaps many of you on this, on this, you know, call to take our client's message and they just kind of turn over digital to us and say, bye, here's the keys to my digital kingdom. Right? Well, the thing is, is voters recognize authenticity. And um, this, we like to call it internally at, at our company, a personal post. This is a post that doesn't use flashy pictures. It doesn't use video. It uses text. And Dan Patrick got attacked by his opponent here in the Texas lieutenant governor's race. They released information that he had some mental health issues a few decades ago. And um, uh, this was dirty, dirty campaign tricks. And what Dan Patrick did was he wrote himself this post that you see on the right here about depression. And we advertised it. You can see how many people that this was reached. Over half a million people in Texas. We were targeting that just to Republican primary voters in Texas. I think we only spent about $10,000 to actually get that reach to that many people. Incredibly powerful. There's not a better rapid response tool. And people are so concerned now, Now, and some of my clients are still very concerned about saying too, too much. Why do we repeat the argument? Well, the thing is, is these people online, they're already active. They already know what's going on. One of my clients had this issue with, with um, uh, uh, nominating Loretta Lynch, and they voted in favor of, nom of the nomination of Loretta Lynch for attorney general in the United States. And a lot of people were up in arms about it from a digital perspective. But what, what we did was we went online and we told people why the client voted for Loretta Lynch, what the thinking of voting for Loretta Lynch was. People appreciate the communication. If you say nothing, they're going to be skeptical of you. So you need to be communicating. And I like these personal posts. Be honest. Be honest. And by the way, you know, uh, uh, especially when we're talking about Facebook, the average person that's engaging with political news, they're they're old. Right. They are old people. Dan Patrick here and Ted Cruz. It's 55 plus who is engaging. Those people don't expect flashy things. They appreciate long form communication like this. I think this is another wonderful example that you see on the left. People were uh, uh, Senator Paul. People were attacking him on the issue of, of vaccines. Well, what he did was, well, guess what? They took a picture of the senator getting a vaccine. Visual, visual is so important, and the you know a picture is worth a thousand freaking words, and that's exactly what Senator Paul did. He responded in this medium directly to this conversation, and he inserted himself in this conversation uh, by posting this picture. So always think about how to respond back with a picture. I think pictures are very, very important. Uh, this is something that people have problems with too. And this goes to back to my internet's the most trusted source of information. And what can we do as practitioners to help push stuff back out? Whether you have a WordPress blog, whether you have content on Twitter, whether you have Pinterest, whether you have an about.me page. By the way, I'd get everything for, for, for your clients. I'd get everything for each one of you. You should own every piece of online, every online property that you can just for search reasons. You should own it. Now, the about me's, the tumblers, vincentharris.tumblr, rampaul.tumblr, danpatrick.tumblr. You should get as many as you can for your clients because it will be helpful from an SEO search perspective. So what is this? Our opponent, David Dewhurst, attacked Dan Patrick for having his name change. He, he got his name changed. What he did, again, this is one reason I love 
Lieutenant Governor Patrick, who crushed our, his opponents here in Texas, he wrote a response to why he got his name changed. And he did change his name. And you can hear it if you Google Dan Patrick name change. It shows up number one on, on Google. His, his response, why he changed his name. This is what people are doing. And it's amazing to me that in, in politics nowadays, people are so scared to put the truth out. Voters are either going to find your truth or they're going to find your opponent's truth. You want them to find your truth. So you need to have an answer for every attack. Right now, if people search Rand Paul isolationist or Rand Paul foreign affairs, we're pushing people to Senator Paul's opinion on foreign affairs. We're not letting other people brand him. He's branding himself. So you see on the on the right, it's a truth versus fact page, which we set up. Everyone should be doing this. You should set up these truth first fact pages from a campaign perspective. And by the way, SeaWorld has even started to do this. I don't know if you've seen the show uh, uh, Blackfish on Netflix about how SeaWorld, how the, you know, the the um, black whales, whatever they're, they're, you know, called, how they killed that one woman down at SeaWorld. And it's all about how they're mistreated and stuff. SeaWorld wasn't doing this for a long, long, long time. And finally, they got the picture. So now if you search Blackfish, if you search, you know, mistreatment of, of SeaWorld animals, they're doing exactly this. They have a truth versus fact page. They have videos. They're being aggressive. You have to do this. If you're getting attacked on TV, people are going online to find out if it's true or not. And they're taking cues. And by the way, it's scary, but most people are clicking on the first link and over 70 percent of people don't go off the first page. So what content is there? Flood the Internet with your positive content. Flood, flood, flood. Next, next example. Uh, I love this, too. We um, we heard that there were some dirty, dirty tricks going on in Texas where one of our opponents was doing a nasty uh, 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 phone call where they were calling voters houses and they were asking, um, they were asking voters, uh, sorry, they were leaving voicemails of, of, um, uh, they were leaving voicemails of voters saying, uh, nasty stuff about Dan Patrick. Well, I'd never seen this. It wasn't my idea. It was our head consultant's idea, but it was a wonderful idea. We went online to get the copy of this tape. So we went online and Dan Patrick said, we will give a thousand dollar reward for the first voter who can give us a copy of this nasty voicemail that's been left. This was a wonderful way to actually see what the opponents were saying uh, and to get people engaged in this process. We got, I think, like eight of the of the voicemail tapes within a like 90 minute period. You can do this with direct mail. You can do this with with phone calls. What are people saying at 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 you know doors and encouraging people to you know you know to to sort of crowdsource what the opposition is is um, uh, doing and we're going to talk a lot about kind of 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 what else and how else to be crowdsourcing today. So I'm a big believer in this slide. This slide I think really represents my belief in digital communications. I think people have so many choices now online that if you're not being entertaining, people are going to click you off. If you're not saying something that people want to listen to, they're going to click you off. They're going to change the channel. They're going to go on BuzzFeed. They're going to watch you know, cat memes. They're going to go to Upworthy. They're going to go to YouTube and just look online. They're going to do a million other things if you're not being interesting. So how do we make things interesting? They need to be short. It needs to be pithy. There's the word snackable that's a little bit overused, but it's a great term. It needs to be snackable and mobile, 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 mobile friendly. That's where the world is going is mobile friendly. People love pop culture too. inserting yourself into what's going on in pop culture. If something's going on in pop culture, actually saying something and insert yourself will get more, more interactions for Senator McConnell. Actually, the majority leader, uh, there was this awful movie in America called Sharknado that came out. It was about a shark and then tornadoes and that ate people and stuff. We even found ways to insert the Sharknado and make it about policy. The Sharknado was tearing up Obamacare and stuff like that. So actually taking pop culture and using pop culture in the 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 you know ways that you're communicating online. And and there's a there's a, a quote down at the bottom that I think is very important. This isn't just made up by by my practices. There's there's another political scientist named Tedesco who says that if information is interactive, people remember it more, right? If people are engaging with the content, they're remembering it more. So let me give you two other ways. There's a wonderful website called Playbuzz, playbuzz.com. We go to Playbuzz and we make quizzes and games and we ask people all the time, if people are taking a quiz or a game, you, you might see people passing around on Facebook and ask, what vegetable are you, right? 
Well, instead of asking people what vegetable they are, we've done things like ask who said it, Obama or King George the uh, third. We we've asked people to take quizzes. Which candidate do you line up best with? If inter if information is interactive, they will remember it more keep thinking about that something else which we are experimenting more and more with and we're launching a video for secure america now today it might be up already is creating is is using uh annotations and i don't know if you all remember growing up i used to be obsessed with multiple ending books where you'd get to like page 20 and it would say if you want to walk through the door go to page 45 if you want to go back outside go to page 75 well, that's powerful. And I loved it. And then you could go back and see what the different endings were. Well, now we're doing this from a political perspective. We're starting to ask people today. We're showing them some information about the Iran deal. And we're asking them, do you agree or disagree with this deal? And depending on what they pick inside of the video, we're taking them to a different video with different information. And by the way, we're also building re remarketing lists to be able to advertise to, to people. So if people watch our content and then they say, I'm against the deal. Well, they'll see they'll be taken somewhere to make calls and and help us move this forward. If they say I'm for the deal, then we take them to more information about why the deal is bad. So using those annotations can be very, very powerful. OK, next uh, mobile mobile. We've talked about stuff shorter uh, um, authenticity. We've talked a lot about about this. One tip, whenever we send emails from fake Gmail accounts, the open rate goes way up and people respond better. Just a small tip. You know, instead of sending emails from, you know, info at rampaul.com that no one believes, right, guys? If, if it doesn't pass the, the, the sniff test, I know that, you know, Bernie Sanders didn't send me the email himself when it came from info at berniesanders.com. That's ridiculous, right? So actually sending emails from, I think ours is rampaulmd at gmail.com and tips like that you know, helps with open rates. And it also helps people, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, sharing of your content. This goes back, um, and I am looking at my Twitter, so feel free to keep, you know, sending me stuff on Twitter. If you have questions, I will try to get through this as quickly as I, as I can too, in about 15 minutes more, and then, uh, and then I'll take questions. So, uh, people have short attention spans, right? These are some website traffic numbers from Rand Paul's website. Uh, this is powerful. This was right around his announcement, I think. And, you know, look, mobile was first. That's amazing. We we don't have mobile first now still, but mobile was first then. And that's largely because a lot of the, of the advertising came from mobile. Second, look at the time spent on the site for mobile versus desktop and tablet. Less than half of time spent on mobile than desktop and tablet. You don't have a lot of time on your website to actually get people, give people the main point. Give it to them now. People are busy. They want to be watching cat gifts. They don't want to be hearing your stuff. So give people, if you have 35 seconds to reach somebody, what are you going to say that's going to keep them there longer and be more interesting? This goes also to the, if content is engaging. If you go to stop the, I think it's stop the bad Iran deal dot, dot com, you will see, or stop the bad Iran deal, um, dot com slash scorecard. Now I pulled these numbers yesterday. Look at the time spent on the, on this website. Two minutes, four minutes, four minutes, three minutes. This is a long time. And why is that? Because we have a lot of engaging content on that site because people are watching videos because people are making phone calls. If you have interesting content, people will stay on your site longer. So keep playing around with it. Keep playing around with it and ask people to do things on your website. Ask people to make calls, ask people to fill out forms, ask people to take petitions and polls and surveys. And by the way, if we looked at this and divided it out by desktop, you might see six or seven minutes spent on, on each of these pages. This is, this is the example of the scorecard website. People are spending time and they're going through and they're clicking each individual senator and they're tweeting at them and they're calling them. It's very powerful. This is one of my favorite websites that we've ever built because of the interaction there. This is a scary number. The average Facebook video right now is 44 seconds. The average time somebody spends, look at this, the best completion rate is 21 seconds of a Facebook video. What does that mean? That means people are watching 21 seconds and then they're leaving. Wow, that's it. Incredible. Now, 
Some people will argue it depends on the content. Is the content good? Of course, the content needs to be good and interesting. But even if you have the most interesting piece of content in the world and someone gets distracted, they're going to click off. Get your information up front. Get your information quick and make things pithy and short. More content that's shorter is better than less content that is longer. Okay? Pithy is good. I love to letting supporters create content for you. So this, we did this around the Super Bowl this year. We used a tab on Facebook. There's a really cool tab product on Facebook called Heyo, H-E-Y-O. And we're a big believer in using tabs on Facebook. You can embed anything in them. You can embed images, videos, forms. And what, what we've seen across all platforms is embedding content on Facebook and running content from Facebook to Facebook gets you better results, gets you more video views, gets you more engagement. People that are on Facebook want to stay on Facebook. So we created this this uh, paper football, we asked people to print them out and send in pictures with the paper football and people did it. And are they gonna do that for every city council race? No, but you would be surprised. People like getting engaged. And by the way, what's it called? Social media or is it called just shoving information at people like on TV media? That's not what it's called, right? This is social media. You should be engaging like this. Go to your supporters and, and have them be a part of the campaign. We did the same thing just two weeks ago where we posted for Senator Paul and we asked people to send in cartoons of his debate, of his debate moment with Senator Christie. People did it. A lot of people did it. And they were creating content for us. This is so powerful. Use people online to crowdsource, to be social. And I spelled cartoon wrong, sorry. But, you know, I mean, use social media as a force to allow people to create content for you, just like we did here. Another example, by the way, I'm obsessed with this website called Ziggio, ziggio.com. Ziggio will allow you to get supporters on any device to record videos for you, and they're saved on the back end. So what we're doing for Senator Paul, we're asking people to we say, do you want to be in a video from, for the campaign? Well, record a video why you endorse Senator Paul, and then we're making these videos with you know pretty good production quality, and we're putting out these videos from the campaign. How awesome is it if you like Senator Paul, you're going to say why you support him, and you see the campaign take time and effort to produce a video with you in it, you're going to share that video with all your friends, and your parents are going to love it, and your family is going to love it, and your friends are going to like it, and it's going to mean something to you. So use that Ziggio to ask people things. Ask them, for example, uh, you know, why they support the police, why they stand against the Iran deal. Ask people anything. Ask them to send in videos. People love to talk. People love to bloviate and go on and on. Give them the opportunity to. This is another thing we did for Senator Paul. We asked people, we asked designers to turn in t-shirt contests and to turn in designs to us on what the next t-shirt should be. So we had designers, they turned in t-shirts. Then we had people vote. And these were the top three t-shirt winners. I personally own the first one. I love the first one. The NSA knows I bought this t-shirt. It's a cool design and you're getting your supporters who are actually wearing and purchasing these things to actually take part in the actual process of, of, um, of, um, uh, uh, sorry, of the creation of this content. This is Snapchat. We've been experimenting with Snapchat ads for the client Secure America Now. We, we've run the first ever Snapchat paid Snapchat filters. We ran one in Ohio. We had 178,000 people, 178,000 uses of the filter that you see on the right in 24 hours. Very powerful. That's a lot of people. I've been very impressed with these filters. I've been very impressed with Snapchat. Snapchat is reaches really, really young people, right? Really young people. Uh, Instagram advertising, which we've done, have done for Secure America Now too, reaches really, really young people. So using mediums like Snapchat, you know, my my uh, thirteen year old cousin, I was visiting her up in her up in uh, Washington D.C. suburb a few weeks ago, and we were talking about social media, and she said, um, you know, Vincent, uh, just so you know, Facebook is for losers now, and you know, I think she's being quite dramatic but her point was people 13 14 15 16 they're not on facebook anymore facebook is an afterthought they're on snapchat number one then they're on instagram then they're then they're on other platforms so how do we reach these younger people and i'm concerned for us as conservatives and as 
Republicans that we're always a little bit of a step behind. So let's not be a step behind. Let's start talking and communicating with these younger voters now. And they're on places like Snapchat. Um, again, uh, please feel free to keep asking me questions on Twitter at Vincent Harris, and I will answer them as soon as I can, as soon as we are you know, done. Um, insert yourself into conversations already going on. Use platforms that work for you. This was a Pinterest page we set up around uh, for Hillary Clinton, for Senator Paul around Valentine's Day. You can see some of the memes and stuff that we used in here. We got some earned media off of it. Um, it was it was it was very visual. I love Pinterest, and my wife loves Pinterest as a as a visual means. It's a great place to be reaching you know women and to be creative. What is the changing nature of of advertising? Right, people are not watching long form TV ads, and people don't believe them anymore. What is one reason Donald Trump is doing so well? in the in the polls in the united states is that people feel like he's not just running the exact same political game he's not spending money in the exact same ways he's saying things that a lot of the base wants to you know hear and i and if you look by the way at the videos that he's producing that he's posting on his facebook page it looks like i produced them back when i was 18 using imovie and I don't say that derogatorily. I say that in the sense that voters don't care about the polish all the time. They care about the content and the substance. So I think people are spending way too much time on the polish and the type of, sorry, and the, and the look of the content. Everything is so freaking staged all the time. Let's just generate content to generate content. That's what Donald Trump is doing a wonderful job of in, in the election. If you go and look at his stuff, again, it looks like it's made literally in movie maker but his stuff's being seen by millions of people and being passed around it's not about the polish it's about the nature of the content and we use websites like meme generator which you see here with some examples reach let's talk a little bit about reach reach is half of the battle what does that mean that means and people someone always asks me Vincent, aren't we dumbing down politics, Vincent? Shouldn't this be serious? We This is about our country and war and the future and poverty and blah, blah, blah. Yes, it is. But you can care and say all these things and write articles and policy papers and everything. But if no one's reading it, then who are you talking to? You're talking to yourself and political elites and journalists, and you need to be talking to the average voter. And if your information is not getting in front of them, then it doesn't freaking matter to me. Right. So reach is half of the battle. I'd say reach is honestly the whole battle. I might change the title of this after because reach is the whole battle. How in such a busy, complex uh, environment online do you get your information to somebody when they'd more rather see drama about Kim Kardashian and Caitlyn Jenner and who married who and blah, blah, blah. That's what people are online to see. And videos of cats, you know, being mad scientists and stuff. That's what people want to look at online. So how do you insert yourself and get reach? Well, what one thing is Facebook, obviously, your reach needs to be based on video. Facebook is really trying to screw YouTube over pretty bad. They're, they're giving a ton of preference to uploaded videos that are uploaded natively to the Facebook platform. Never again should you post a video from YouTube on Facebook. You should upload every video to Facebook natively. It will get a bunch more reach. We are getting punished. Our pages are getting punished when we're linking externally to a website from Facebook. Facebook's really trying hard to keep everyone on the Facebook platform. So upload content to Facebook and you'll get more reach. Secondly, is things like this. Look, this didn't even say retweet to, you know, to, you know, share this. It was well. These starter packs were going around, where you had, you know, uh, you know, frat daddy starter pack. It'd be a, you know, a six pack of beer and a, and a pair of Sperry's and some hair gel or something. Well, we inserted our message into this into this starter pack motif. The president who thinks he's a king starter pack. Look at what's going on online. Look at what the trends are. Look at look at different types of memes and insert your message and your candidate and your group into that message. That's going to get you the most reach. And, you know, people and journalists, especially, they make fun of a lot of my clients sometimes, or they'll say, he's trying to look cool or whatever, blah, blah, blah. That's all BS because this is using the internet well. This isn't trying to look cool. If someone's using starter packs, then use starter packs. That's not trying to look cool. That's using the internet in the, in the way that it's meant to be used. Again, reach is half of the 
of the battle. When we were working for Prime Minister Netanyahu from um, Israel, when he came to America to to speak and give his give his discussion before Congress, these this person graphics worked really really well. So people were sharing this person is going to watch. And by the way, on graphics, we're seeing every time we use arrows like this arrow on the left, uh, you can see on that share to um, uh, win graphic, people are sharing those more. And because I'm believing how the algorithm is actually working on Facebook, if you use the term share or comment or something, I'm pretty certain Facebook is punishing that content. But it can't read what the actual text and graphic is in the graphic that you upload. So that's why I think putting that text share, comment, whatever, inside the graphic is much better than the actual text, which I'm pretty sure is limiting you. Okay, piggybacking off of your of your um, you know brand. So this was during the State of the Union. Mr. Obama said that President Obama said that he was going to give you know free college. And Senator Paul, as soon as that happened, we got this out. What are people talking about, and how can you piggyback off of what's already going on? This is half of the battle. Reach, reach is half of the battle. This is what we talked about earlier. Okay, people, if they're online, y'all just stay with me. If they're online and they're going to Google, when else in the political process of anything that people do in politics are they actually looking for information about you? Most of the time in the normal advertising is all flipped upside down. We shove messages at people again and again and again, and that's what we fund first, and that's what we do first. Let's shove messages. If you run a 1,000 points on TV, people will get it, and the message will sink in, blah, blah, blah. Okay? And that's what we fund first. That's what we spend the most amount of time on first. What we should be spending the time on first is making sure that with all the noise on television and everything going on, that people, when they're looking for information about you, that they're seeing good things. 75% of people don't go past the first page. 53% of people click on the first link. What are people seeing about you? What are they seeing about your candidate, your campaign, and your brand? You need to be first. You need to be have a lot of content on the first page that's telling your story. You need to have content on YouTube. You need to have content on Twitter. You need to have searchable content and upload it everywhere, not a single platform, but cross-platform. And make sure that you are using the internet as a as as what it should be used, which is a a you know library of information. I love infographics. They're a visual way to be telling stories. This is some great examples. You should use infographics. I don't think we need to belabor that, you know, point. And this is this is great. So these are some graphics that we did for Senator McConnell. And my favorite of this is the one of the woman that says Grimes equals Obama. So we took somebody that we took a picture of. We incorporated that into a post. We have the share on the graphic and we're telling a story. We're, we're allowing voters to get a cue that if they vote for Alison Grimes, they're voting for President Obama. And we were building this, this separation between Senator McConnell and Alison Grimes through the messages that we're telling. People, you know, when, when I was up at uh, giving this presentation in Ottawa earlier this year, I went after someone from someone from Facebook who was talking about how candidates need to be posting more of what they're eating and stuff like that. I personally don't think that posting a bunch of pictures of what people are eating is going to change a lot of people's votes, right? What is going to change a lot of people's votes? People are voting selfishly. They're, they are voting rationally. So tell them why. Tell them what your differences are. Tell them Alison Grimes is President Obama. They hate President Obama in Kentucky. So they're going to hate Alison Grimes too. Tell them why you're better than the other person and tell it again and again and again. That guy, Dan Patrick, who I showed you, who's lieutenant governor of Texas, we talked about one issue online, border security. We built the Facebook page around border security with ads that said, like, if you want to secure a border. Our graphic said, secure the border, vote Dan Patrick. He did town halls on border security. He went to the border. We did online surveys around the border. We got into a debate with the mayor of San Antonio uh, 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 Julian Castro, who was in favor of all these, you know, open border policies, and we debated him on the issue of border security. Border security was our issue, and people remember that. And we drilled it again and again and again, and we did it in interesting ways. We did it in unique, entertaining ways, but we still kept on message. 
If you go back and look at the the campaign time machine, this is one of my favorite websites we've ever done. It's called DoFeed, and it highlighted, uh, um, you know, it was for Dan Patrick who I've referenced multiple times against his opponent, David Dewhurst. Uh, and we used listicles, cat listicles, to actually highlight why David Dewhurst was a bad candidate. So go back in the Wayback Machine and you can check it out. I think that's the last thing before we have questions is this slide. Search advertising is very important. You can set this up on Google AdWords. You can have an agency. If you have an agency, I'm a big believer in search advertising. For Rand Paul's campaign, the first thing we're funding out of our budget every month is search advertising. That's the first thing that, that we're funding. When people are searching for more information about Rand Paul, we want to be there. We want to be there with search advertising. It's the only time people are proactively seeking information. It's what's called in political science the time of decision, right? People are actually spending their time to go and look for that freaking information. You need to be there. And if you're not there in first place, people are going to click and they're going to find out poopy information on you. You must, must be there. So please ask me questions on Twitter. Uh, I have a couple that, you know, I can, I can, you know, answer. Uh, what has been, Lanny asked, what is the biggest challenge growing your online audience and engagement? I'd say the biggest challenge has been one, when you grow your audience, I mean, you can do it organically and you can do paid, right? Growing organically has become really, really hard. On places like Twitter, what some people outside of this of this room do at our company is we'll go and, you know, let's say Senator Rob Portman in Ohio. We want to grow his Twitter following. Well, we'll go and find other members of Congress in Ohio and we'll start following followers of them to help grow our following organically. Certainly using things like hashtags and all these things are going to slowly grow your your online audience. But engagement is really hard. Uh, Lanny asks, what is the challenge? with engagement. I'd say the biggest challenge is Facebook, which is the behemoth, right? Facebook keeps changing their algorithm. Now it's all about video. Now it's about keeping content on Facebook. When we first started digital, uh, you know, this was very, very different. This was, I'm going to try to get to just, this is just me here. Can I go to me? Let me see. Turn on your webcam. Okay. On now. Hang on. Uh, I don't know if I can see it or not. Hopefully it's still, oh, there we go. Okay. So when when we first started this, Facebook was um, was wanting people on the platform, so they made it very easy for you to invite your friends, for you to invite your you know family on the platform, and engagement was very easy. Now, because the average person has hundreds of Facebook friends, and the average person has thousands and hundreds of pages that they're liking, and they're liking more every single day, it's becoming harder and harder to actually get someone to see your content in the newsfeed. So most interactions on Facebook occur where? They occur on mobile newsfeed. This is where most Facebook interactions occur, mobile newsfeed. So how do you get your information in mobile newsfeed? This is done a few ways, right? One, Facebook's remembering every time you interact with a previous piece of content, right? So if you go and you creep on an ex-boyfriend or girlfriend and you look at their photos, Facebook is remembering that. Facebook is remembering if you've liked a photo, if you shared a photo from a certain page, from a friend. They're remembering all that and they're delivering you information that they think the algorithm thinks you want to see again. So if you're liking a page and then you're not interacting with the content, it's it's limiting that content from you seeing it. So that's what's been pretty hard from an engagement perspective. So just keeping remembering that. Um, Clayton asked a good question. Besides post broadcast democracy, what other books would you recommend? I would recommend reading that um, that um, uh, a study. There's a there's a wonderful study online by two political scientists called Kim and Vishak. Uh, the study is about uh, source cues, and it and it talks a lot about how we forget where we get information from online. And this goes back to our engagement comment again that um, that you know we just need to get information in front of people, and then they will remember that information, but they'll forget where the information comes from. So there's a wonderful study by Kim and, Kim and Vishak. Um, what else? There is a great, um, there is a great, and I wish I could pull it up, but it would take me too um, uh, long. I think it was in PMAG, if that exists. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's called Obama's Not-So-Big Data. 
If you Google that, Obama's not so big data. It's a wonderful, wonderful article. I think it's my favorite article. I mean, let me look it up. Uh, Obama, not so big data. It is the best article on campaigns and stuff. Yeah, Obama's not so big data. P.S. Mag by Pacific Standard. Oh my gosh, it's a wonderful article. Everyone should read that article. It's a really long article. It gets into a lot of detail about Obama's campaign, a lot of things. I don't know why the article hasn't gotten more attention. So I would say that I would say that those are, are very important. There's also a, a wonderful book that's a little bit old now, but the premises are still really true. True. It's by two communication scientists, uh, Iyengar and and Kinder, and the book is called like Media Choice in America, or uh, hang on, let me let me figure it out. Iyengar and Kinder, the book is called. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. It's a scary book because it talks about. Uh, it's called News That Matters. Iyengar and Kinder. It's a scary book because it talks about how the media essentially creates the agenda for everything in politics. So it's a wonderful book. Check it out. Iyengar and and Kinder. Um, what is the percent of people, Paul asks, that engage online, mobile, social media, but also vote? Wonderful question, Paul. So there's been a lot of studies out about people who engage online are more likely to vote. So one of the best studies is by a political scientist from the University of, of, of California, San Diego. His name is Fowler. If you Google Fowler, you'll find two things about him. He writes a study about about friend groups and about how people are more likely to vote if they have friends who are voting. But the second study that he writes is about the you know power of the Facebook um, of the I voted sticker. And he looks, I think, at the 2010 elections, might have been the 2012 elections uh, in California. They did some testing and had a control group, and how powerful that the Facebook. Uh, I voted sticker was. So check out those studies. And, you know, Paul, what's the percent of people? Online engagement equals offline engagement. That's what studies have, you know, shown. There's this concept of a slacktivist, and this is what people are concerned a lot about, which is, you know, are people online, if they click like and stuff, are they actually engaging? Yes. Pew Research has a lot on their website. If you go to Pew Research Democracy Project, you can read a lot on Pew Research's website. If you engage on Facebook, you're more likely to to um, to engage um, offline. If you engage on Facebook, you're more likely to attend an event offline. If you are active online, you're more likely to to you know vote. So I'll take one more question. If anyone has one more question, to tweet at me at Vincent Harris. Um, um, I'll take one more after this one. Lanny asks, what vertical? Has has garnered the the you know most reach for Rand Paul Facebook Mobile Facebook Mobile is you know so important. Uh, Facebook Mobile has been very very uh, very good for us for generating website traffic, for generating donations, for generating purchases at our campaign store. Um, so does anyone have one more? question if anyone has any questions uh peter do you have a question you've been asked talking a lot today but no questions peter uh okay if no one has any other questions um let me make sure does it matter or should you uh, okay does it matter or if your client is the real person answering is it okay for an agency uh that's a great Question. I think people, again, appreciate authenticity. Normally what, what we do is we'll work with the client. We'll have a bunch of different preset answers, and then we'll go and we'll engage with certain people. But by the way, engaging in the comments is part of this, right? Social media, we do need to engage in the comment section and on Twitter with people that are interacting with us and with our with our clients. So it's actually something that every day we will go in and we'll look at comments and, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll often look at the you know, top comments. What is the top comment? Who's, who has interacted with those comments? The, 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 you know, most and kind of filter that out and then interact directly with those, with those people. So, um, last question in two minutes, Paul asks again, do you use get out the vote emails to get a response? Yes, get out the vote emails are important, but the thing is, is email has an open rate of what, an average of 10 to 15 percent. Uh, text messaging is another good way to get out the you know vote. And one thing that we'll do for our clients, here's a little trade secret, is we'll film a video of the client saying today's election day, get out and 
um, you know, vote. And then we'll run that video to people who've been to our website and ask them to get out to vote. And we'll run the video to them as they're watching YouTube videos, encouraging them, hearing from the candidate directly, get out to vote, asking people and telling them directly what to do and asking them to turn out to, you know, vote. So guys and guys and ladies, I really appreciated it. Um, you can email me, Vincent at Harris Media LLC dot com or tweet me at Vincent Harris. And this was wonderful. William, I don't know if you come back on or anything, but I really appreciate it. And I hope everybody else, you know, did. If there was something that that we could have done to have made it any better, please let me, you know, know. Thank you all a lot. Well, and thank you very much to uh, Vincent on behalf of the Manning Center and the Manning Center Training Program. We really appreciate your taking the time today to come speak to us. For those of you who uh, listened in, this is part of our regular training offerings. We like to offer webinars on different topics from different speakers, interesting speakers, speakers who have tremendous experience. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be announcing new webinars in the next few weeks as we bring them online. And with that, we wish uh, everybody a great day. And thanks again for joining us. Thank you.